proceed, Salinas, to procure my fall by the doom of death, and blows and all. Merchant of Syracuse, a plead no more. I am not partial to infringe our laws, the enmity and discord, which have late sprung from the rancorous outrage of your duke, to merchants, our well-dealing countrymen, who, wanting gilders to redeem their lives, have sealed thy rigorous statutes in their bloods, excludes all pain from our threatening looks. For since the mortal and intestine jars twixt thy seditious countrymen and us, it hath in solemn sentence been decreed, both by the Syracusans and ourselves, to admit no traffic to our adverse towns. Nay more, if any foreign Ephesus be seen at Syracuse and Marts or Bears, again, if any Syracusan born come to the Bay of Ephesus, he dies, and his goods confiscate to the Duke's dispose, unless a thousand marks be levied to quit the penalty and to ransom him. Thy substance, valued at the highest rate, can amount, cannot amount unto a hundred marks. Therefore, by law, thou art condemned to die. Yet this my comfort, when your words are done, my woes and likewise with the evening sun. Well, Syracusan, say and brief the cause why thou departest from thy native home, and for what cause thou camest to Ephesus. In Syracuse was I born, and when, unto a woman happy but for me, and by me had not our hat been bad. With her I lived in joy, her wealth increased by prosperous voyages, so I often made that damn them, till my factor's death and the great care of goods at random left drew me from kind embracements of my spouse, whom my absence was not six months old before herself, almost at fainting under the pleasing punishment that women bear had made provision for her following me, and soon in safe arriving where I was. There had she not been long, but she became a joyful mother of two goodly sons, and which was strange, the one so like the other as could not be distinguished but by names. That very hour, and in the selfsame inn, a meaner woman was delivered of such a burden male, twins both alike. Those, for their parents were exceeding poor, I bought, brought up to attend my sons. My wife, not meanly proud of two such boys, made daily motions for our home return. Unwilling, I agreed. Alas, too soon we came aboard. A league from Epidamnum had we sailed before the always window bay indeed gave any tragic instance of our harm. But longer did we not retain much hope. For what obscured light the heavens did grant, did but convey unto our fearful minds a doubtful warrant of immediate death. The sailors sought for safety by our boat, and left the ship then sinking right to us. My wife, more careful for the latter board, had fastened them unto a small spare mast, such as seafaring men provide for storms. And one of the other twins was bowed, whilst I had been like he of the other. The children thus disposed, my wife and I, fixing our eyes on those to whom our care is fixed, fastened ourselves at either end of the mast, floating straight, obedient to the stream, was carried towards Corinth, as we thought. At length the sun, gazing upon the earth, dispersed those vapors that offended us, and by the benefit of his wish and light, the seas waxed calm, and we discovered two ships from far making a main to us, of Corinth that, of Epidaurus this. But ere they came, Ugh, let me say no more. Gather the sequel by that one before. Nay, nay, nay. <laughs> for, old man, do not break off so, for we may pity thee, though not pardon thee. <laughs> had the gods done so, I had not now worthily turned them merciless to us. For ere the ships could meet by twice five leagues, we were encountered by a mighty rock, which being violently borne upon, our helpful ship was split in the midst. So that in this unjust divorce of us, fortune had left to both of us alike. What to delight in, what to sorrow for. Her part, poor soul, seeking and burdened with lesser weight, but not with lesser woe. 
was carried with more speed before the wind, and in our sight they three were taken up by fishermen of Corinth, as we thought. At length, another ship had seized on us, and knowing whom it was their hap to save, gave helpful welcome to their shipwrecked guests, and would have wrecked the fishes of their prey, and not their part in very slow of sail. And therefore homeward did they bend their course. Thus have you heard me, severed from my bliss, that by misfortunes which my life prolonged to tell sad stories of my own mishaps. And for those that sorrow swore, do me the favor to delight at full what hath befallen them as thee, till now. For my youngest boy, and yet my eldest care, at eighteen years became inquisitive after his brother, and importuned me that his attendant, for his case was like, reft of his brother, but retained his name, might bear him company in the search of him, whom, whilst I labored of a love to see, I hazarded the loss of whom I loved. Five summers have I spent in farthest Greece, roaming clean through the bounds of Asia, and coasting homeward, came to Ephesus, hopeless to find, and yet loath to leave unsought, or that, or any place that harbors men. But here must end the story of my life, and happy were I in my timely death, could all my travels warrant me they live. Oh, hapless Aegean, whom the fates have marked to bear the extremity of dire Now trust me, we're not against our laws, against my crown, my oath, my dignity, which princes would they, may not disannul, my soul should sue as advocate for thee. But though thou art judged to death, and past the sentence may not be recalled, but to our honor's great disparity. Yet will I favor thee in what I can. Therefore, merchant. <laughs> Therefore, merchant, I will limit thee this day to seek thy half by beneficial health. Try all the friends thou hast in Ephesus. Beg or borrow to make up the sum, and live. If no, then thou art doomed to die. Jailer, take him to thy custody. I will, my lord. Hopeless and helpless doth the Gian when, but to procrastinate his life is life. Too soon be confiscated. This very day, a Syracusan merchant is apprehended for arrival here, and not being able to buy out his life, according to the statutes of the town, dies for the weary sun set in the west. There is your money that had to be. Go bear to the centaur where we host, and stay there, Romeo, till I come to thee. Within this hour it will be dinner time. Till that I'll view the manners of the town, peruse the trade and gaze upon the buildings, and then return and sleep within my end, for with long travel I am stiff and weary. Get you away. Many a more, many a man would take you at your word and go indeed having so good a mean. A trusty villain, sir, that very oft when I am dull with care and melancholy, lightens my humor with his merry jests. What, will you walk with me about the town and then go to my inn and dine with me? I am invited, sir, to certain merchants of whom I hope to make much benefit of. I crave your pardon. Soon, five o'clock, please you, I'll meet with you upon the mark, and after, consort you until bedtime. My present business calls me from you now. Farewell till then. I will go lose myself and wander up and down to view the city. Sir, I commend you to your content. He that commends me to my own content commends me to the thing I cannot get. I, to the world, am like a drop of water that in the ocean seeks another drop, who, falling there to find his fellow forth, unseen, inquisitive, confounds himself. So I, to find a mother and a brother, unhappy, lose myself. 
Here comes the almanac of my true date. What now? How chance thou art returned so soon? Returned so soon? Rather approach too late. The capon burns, the pig falls from the spit, the clock has struck in twelve upon the bell. My mistress made it one upon my cheek. She so hot because the meat is cold. The meat is cold because you come not home. You come not home because you have no stomach. You have no stomach, having broke your fast. Believe that no one is to fast and pray are penitent for your default today. Stop in your wind, sir. Tell me this I crave. Where have you left the money that I gave you? Oh, six pence that I had at Wednesday last to pay the saddler for my mistress's crupper? The saddler had it, sir. I kept it not. I am not in a sportive humor now. Tell me and dally not where is the money. We being strangers here, how darest thou trust so great a charge to my own custody? Ha, 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 ha. I pray you, jest, sir, as you said at dinner. I, for my mistress, come to you in post. If I return, I shall be posted indeed, for she will score your fault upon my hate. Methinks your ma, like mine, should be your clock and strike you home without a messenger. Come, Dromeo, come, these jets are out of season. Reserve them till a merry hour than this. Where is the gold I gave in charge to thee? To me, sir? Why, you gave no gold to me. Come on, sir knave, have done your foolishness, and tell me how thou hast disposed my charge. My charge was to fetch you from the mart home to your house. The phoenix, sir, to dinner. My mistress and her sister stays for you. Now, as I am a Christian, answer me in what safe place you have bestowed my money, or I shall break that merry sconce of yours that stands on tricks when I am undisposed. Where is the thousand marks thou hadst of me? I have some marks of yours upon my feet, some of my mistress's marks upon my shoulders, but not a thousand marks between you. If I should pay your worship those again, perchance you will not bear them patiently. Thy mistress's marks? What mistress slave hast thou? Your worship's wife, my mistress, at the Phoenix. She that I fast till you come home to dinner and praise that you will hide you home to dinner. What wilt thou flout me thus under my face being forbid? There take you not, sir knave. What mean you, sir? For God's sake, hold your hands, nay. And you will not, I'll take my needles! Upon my life, by some device or other, the villain is overwrought of all my money. They say this town is full of cousins. It's nimble jugglers that deceive the eye, dark working sorcerers that change the mind, soul killing witches that deform the body, disguising cheaters, praying mountebanks. And many such like liberties of sin. If it proves so, I will be gone no sooner. All to the century will seek the slave. Greatly fear my money is not safe. Endued with intellectual sense and souls, of more preeminence than fish and fowls, 
are their females masters and their lords? So let your will attend on their courts. This servitude makes you to keep unwed. Not this, but troubles of the marriage bed. But were you wedded, you would bear some sway. Ere I learn love, I'll practice to obey. How if your husband start some other where? Till he come home again, I would forbear. Patience unmoved, no marvel though she pause. They can be meek, but have no other cause. A wretched soul bruised with adversity, we bid be quiet when we, we hear it cry. But were we burdened with light weight of pain, as much or more we should ourselves complain. So thou, that hast no unkind fate to grieve thee, with urging helpless patience, would relieve me. But if thou live to see like right bereft, this fool begged patience in me will be left. Well, I will marry one day, but try. Up, oh, here comes your man. Now is your husband nigh. Say, is your tardy master nigh hand? Nay, he is at two hands with me, and that my two ears can witness. Say, didst thou speak with him? No, thou his mind. I, I, he told his mind upon mine ear. Bestrew his hand, I scarce could understand it. Spoke he so doubtfully thou couldst not feel his meaning? Nay, he struck so plainly, I could too well feel his blows, and with all so doubtfully, that I could scarce understand them. But say, I prithee, is he coming home? It seems he hath great care to please his wife. My mistress, sure my master is horn mad. Horn mad, the villain! I mean, not couple mad, but <laughs> sure he is stark mad. When I desired him to come home to dinner, he asked me for a thousand marks in gold. Tis dinner time, quoth I. My gold, quoth he. Your meat doth burn, quoth I. My gold, quoth he. Will you come, quoth I? My gold, quoth he. Where's the thousand marks I gave thee, villain? Away and weeping die. 
How many fond fools serve mad jealousy? Wit in all one word to understand. 
Fie, brother, how the world has changed with you. When were you wont to use my sister thus? She sent for you by Dromeo home to dinner. By Dromeo? By me? <laughs> by thee, and this thou didst return from him, that he did buffet thee, and did his blows deny my house for his, me for his wife. Did you converse, sir, with this gentlewoman? What is the course and drift of your compact? I, sir, I never saw her till this time. Villain, thou liest, for even her very words didst thou deliver to me on the march. I never spoke with her in all my life. How can she thus then call us by our names? Unless it be by inspiration! How ill agrees it with your gravity to counterfeit thus grossly with your slave, abetting him to thwart me in my mood. Be it my wrong, nor for me exempt, but wrong not that wrong with a more contempt. Come, I will fasten on this sleeve of thine. Thou art an elm, my husband, I a vine, whose weakness, married to thy stranger state, makes me with thy strength to communicate. If aught possess thee from me, it is dross. Cue serving I me, friar, or I will lose moss. Who? All for want of proving with intrusion, infest thy sap, and live on thy confusion. To me she speaks. She moves me for her theme. What, was I married to her in my dream? Or sleep I now and think I hear all this? What error drives our eyes and ears amiss? Until I know the sure uncertainty, I'll entertain the offered fallacy. Dromeo, go bid the servants spread for dinner. Oh, for my deeds, I cross me for a sinner. This is the very land. Oh, spite of spite, we talk with owls, goblins, and sprites. If we obey them not, this will ensue. They'll suck our breath, or pinch us black and blue. Why prayest thou to thyself and answer not? Dromeo, thou drone, thou smell, thou slug, thou sot. I am transformed, master, am I not? I think thou art in mind, and so am I. Nay, both in mind and in my shape. Thou hast thine own form. No, I am an ape. If thou art transformed to aught, tis to an ass. Tis true, she rides me, and I long for breath. Tis so, I am an ass, else it could never meet be, but I should know her as well as she knows me. Come, come, no longer will I be a fool to put the finger in the eye and weep, whilst man and master laughs my woes to scorn. Come, sir, to dinner. Dromeo, keep the gate. Husband, I'll dine above with you today and try you of a thousand idle pranks. Sirrah, if any ask you for your master, say he dines forth and let no creature enter. Come, sister, Romeo, play the porter well. Am I in earth, in heaven, or in hell? Sleeping or waking, mad or well advised? No none to these and to myself disguised? I'll say as they say, and for ever so, and in this mist at all adventures go. Master, shall I be porter at the gate? I, and let none enter, lest I break your pate. Come, come, Antipholus, we dine too late. You would keep from my heels and beware of 
of an ass. You're sad, Senor Balthazar. Pray God our good cheer may answer my good will and your good welcome here. I hold your dainties to you, sir, and you're welcome, dear. Oh, Senor Balthazar, either a flesh or fish, a table full of welcome makes scarce one dainty dish. Good meat, sir, is common, that every troll for And welcome more common, for that's nothing but words. But though my cakes be mean, take them in good part. Better cheer may you have, but not with better heart. But soft, my door is locked. Go, bid them let us in. <coughs> Maud, Bridget, Marianne, Cecily, Jillian, Jen. Mom, Mom, horse, capon, coxcomb, idiot, pet. Either get thee from the door or sit down at the hatch. Dost thou conjure for wenches that you call for such store when one is one too many? Go, get thee from the door. What patch is made our porter? My master stays in the street. Let him go out from whence he came, lest he catch cold on his feet. Who talks with him there? Oh, open the door. Right, sir, I'll tell you when, and you'll tell me wherefore. Wherefore? For my dinner. I have not dined today. Nor today, here you must not. Come again when you may. What art thou that keeps me from the house I own? The porter for this time, sir. And my name is Dromeo. Oh, villain! Thou hast stolen both my office and my name. The one ne'er got me credit, the other make no blame. If thou hast been Dromeo today in my place, thou hast changed thy face for an aim or thy name for an ass! What a corn is there, Dromeo? Who are those at the gate? Let my master in loose! No, he comes too late, and so tell your master. Oh, Lord, I must laugh. Have at you with the proverb? Shall I set in my staff? Oh, let it not be so. 
Karen, you wore against your reputation. And probably the most suspect the unviolated honor of your wife. What's this? Your long experience of her wisdom, her sober virtue, her years, her modesty, putting on her part some cause to you unknown. And doubt not, sir, but she will well to you when it is time to join me against you. Be ruled by me. Depart in patience and let us to the tiger all to dinner. About evening, come yourself alone to know the reason for this strange restraint. If by strong hand you offer to bring him now, in the stirring passage of the day, a vulgar comment will be made of it, and that supposed by a common route against <laughs> your yet ungall estimation, and that he would foul intrusion and during the 1200 break we were dead. For slander lives upon succession forever, house wherever it gets possession. You have prevailed. I will depart in quiet, and in despite of mirth, me to be married. I know of a wench of excellent discourse, pretty and witty, wild and yet too gentle. To there we will dine. This woman, I mean, my wife, but I protest without dessert, hath oftentimes upbraided me withal. So her we go up to dinner. Good sir, get you home and fetch the chain. By this high note, says maid, bring it, I pray you, to the porcupine, for there is the house. This chain I will bestow, be it for nothing but to spite my wife, upon my hostess there. Good sir, make haste. Since mine own doors refuse to entertain me, I'll knock elsewhere to see if they are the same thing. I'll meet you at that place, sir. Do so, this jest shall cost me some expense. <laughs> Not 
mad, but maiden. How I do not know. Tis some fault that springeth from your eye. For gazing on your beams, fair sun being by. To gaze where you should, and that will clear your sight. As good to wink, sweet love, as look on night. Why call you me love? Call my sister so. My sister, sister. That's my sister. No. It is myself, my own self's better part, my eyes' clear eye, my dear heart's dearer heart, my food, my fortune, my sweet hope's aim, my soul, earth's heaven, and my heaven's clay. All this my sister is, or else should be. Call thyself sister, sweet, for I am thee. Thee will I love, and with thee leave my life. Thou hast no husband yet, nor I no wife. Give me thy hand. Oh, soft hers, sirs, hold you still. I'll fetch my sister and get her goodwill. Sister, 
possessed with such a gentle, sovereign grace, of such enchanting presence and discourse, that I must make a traitor to myself. But lest myself be guilty to self wrong, I'll stop my ears against the mermaid's song. Master Antipolis! Aye, oh, that's my name. I know it well, sir. Lo, here's the chain. I thought you'd taken you at the porcupine, but the chain unfinished had made me stay thus long. What is your will that I shall do with this? What please yourself, sir? I made it for you. Made it for me, sir? I have spoken not. Not once, nor twice, but twenty times you have. Go home with it, and please your wife with all. And soon at supper time, I'll visit you and then receive my money for the chain. And pray, sir, receive your money now, for fear you never see chain or money more. You are a merry man, sir, very well. What I should think of this, I cannot tell. But this I think. There is no man is so vain who would refuse so fair an offered chain. For I see a man here needs not live by shifts, when in the streets he needs such golden gifts. All to the martyr, therefore, Dromeo say, if any ship put forth, then straight away. <laughs> Get thee down, buy thou a rope, and bring it home to me. I buy a thousand pound a year, I buy a rope. A man as well who bought that trusts you. I was promised your presence and the chain, but neither chain nor goldsmith came to me. For like you thought our love would last too long if it were chained together and chills come not. Saving your merry humor. Here's the notes. How much your chain weighs to the utmost good, the fineness of gold and charitable fashion, which doth amount to three odd buckets more than I stand at it to this gentleman. I pray you, see him presently discharged, for he is bound to see and stays but for it. I am not furnished with the present money. Besides, I have some business in the town. Good senor, take this stranger to my house and bid my wife disperse the sum on the receipt thereof. Perchance I'll be there as soon as you. Then you will bring the chain to her yourself. No, bear it with you, lest I come not time enough. Well, sir, I will. Have you the chain about you? And if I have not, I hope you have, or else you return without your money. <laughs> Nay, come, I pray you, give me the chain. Both wind and tide stays for this gentleman, and I to blame have held him here too long. <laughs> Good lord, you use this dalliance to excuse your breach of promise to the porcupine? I should have chid you for not bringing it, but... Like a shrew, you first begin to brawl. The hour is on. I pray you, sir, dispatch. You know how he importunes me the chain. Why, give it to my wife and fetch your money. Come, come. You know I gave it to even now. Either send the chain or send me by some token. Fine, now you run the humor out of breath. Come, where's the chain? I pray you let me see it. Oh, my business. Get up from this dalliance. Oh. Good sir, say what you will answer me or no. If not, I'll leave him to the officer. I answer you? What should I answer you? <laughs> the money that you owe me for the chain. I owe you none till I receive the chain. You know I gave you half an hour since. You gave me none, and you wronged me much to say so. You wrong me more, sir, and deny it. Consider how it stands upon my credit. Well, officer, arrest them at my suit. I do, and charge you the duke's name to obey me. Arrest me, foolish fellow, if thou darest. Arrest him, officer. I would not spare my brother in this case if he should scorn me so apparently. 
I do arrest you, sir. You hear the suit. I do obey thee till I give thee bail. But, sirrah, by the sport as dear, as all the metal in your shop will answer. Sir, sir, I shall have law in Ephesus to your notorious shame. I doubt it not. Master, there's a bark of that the damned man that stays left till her owner comes aboard. Then, sir, she bears away. Oh. Our brother, sir, I have conveyed aboard. I have bought the oil, the balsamum, and aquavite. The ship is in her trip. The merry wind blows fair from land. They stay for not at all but their owner, master, and yourself. How now? A <laughs> oh, madman. Why thou peevish sheep? What ship of Epidamnum says for me? The ship you sent me for, to hire waftage? Thou drunken slave, I sent thee for a rope, and told thee to what purpose and what end? You sent me for a rope's end as soon. You sent me to the bay, for a bark. I will debate this matter more leisure, and teach your ears to list me with more heed. They drown, Bill, and hide me straight. Give her this key and tell her in the desk that's covered over the Turkish tapestry there's a purse of ducats. Let her send it. Tell her I am arrested in the street and that shall avail me. I may slave be gone. An officer to prison till I come. To Adriana, that is where we dine today, where Jocelyn did claim me as her husband. She is too big, I hope, for me to compass. Thither go I, although against my will, for servants must their master's minds fulfill. <laughs> Sergeant, 
draws back in very fear. Is it time or in debt? How fondly does that reason? Time is a very bankrupt who owes more than he's worth to seize it. Nay, he's a thief too. Have you not heard men say that time goes stealing on by night and day? If a bee in debt and theft and a sergeant on the way, hath he not reason to turn back an hour in a day? Coach Romeo bears the money, bear it straight, and bring my master home immediately. Come, sister, I am pressed down with conceit, conceit my comfort and my injury. <laughs> Of his own doors being shut against his entrance. 
Belike his wife, acquainted with his fits, on purpose shut the doors against his way. My way is now to hie home to his house and tell his wife that, being a lunatic, he rushed into my house and took perforce my ring away. This course I fittest choose, for forty ducats is too much to lose. Depart from thence. In verity you did. My bones bear witness. 
that have since felt the vigor of his rage. Is it good to soothe him in these contraries? There is no shame. The fellow finds his vein, and yielding to it, humors well his frenzy. Thou hast suborned the goldsmith to arrest me. Alas, I sent you money to redeem you. by Romeo here, who came in haste for it. Money by me? Heart and goodwill you might, but surely, master, not a right of money. Went not thou to her for a purse of ducats? He came to me, and I delivered it. And I witness of her that she did. God and the rope maker bear me witness that I was sent for nothing but a rope! Mistress, both man and master is possessed. I know it by their pale and deadly looks. They must be bound and laid in some dark room. Say, wherefore didst thou lock me forth today? And why dost thou deny the bag of gold? I did not, gentle husband, lock me forth. And gentle master, I received no gold. But I confess, sir, that we were locked out. Dissembling villain, thou speak'st false in both. Dissembling harlot, thou art false in all, and art confederate with a damned impact to make a loathsome abject scorn of me. But with these nails, I'll pluck out these false eyes that would perceive me in this shameful sport. Oh, bite him, bite him, let him come back, hear me! More company, the fiend is strong within him. I mean, how pale and warm he looks. What, will you murder me? Thou, Jayla, thou, I am thy prisoner. Wilt thou suffer them to make a rescue? Masters, let him go. He is my prisoner, and you shall not have him. What wilt thou do, thou peevish officer? Hast thou delight to see a wretched man do outrage and displeasure to himself? He is my prisoner. If I let him go, the death he owes will be required of me. I will discharge thee ere I go from thee. Bear me forth with unto his creditor, and knowing how the debt grows, I will pay it. Good master, doctor, see him safe, conveyed home to my house. Oh, most unhappy day. Oh, most unhappy Strouthen. Master, I am here entered in bond for you. Out on me, villain. Wherefore dost thou mad me? Will you be bound for nothing? Be mad, good master, cried the devil! Oh, God, help oh, poor souls, how idly do they talk. Go, bear him hence. Sister, go you with me. Huh? One Angelo Goldsmith, do you know him? I know the man. What is the sum he owes? Two hundred ducats. Say, how grows it do? Do you buy a chain your husband had of him? He did bespeak a chain for me, but had it not. When is your husband, all enraged today, came to my house and took away my ring, the ring I saw upon his finger now? Soon after did I meet him with a chain. It may be so, but I did never see it. Come, jailer, bring me where the goldsmith is. I long to know the truth hereof at large. God, for thy mercy, they are loose again! Come with naked swords. Let's home our help to have them bound again! <laughs> Not without some scandal to yourself, with circumstances and 
deny it or forswear it. These ears of mine, thou knowest they hear thee. Ah, oh, fie thee, wretch! Tis pity that thou livest to walk where any honest men resort. Thou art a villain to impeach me thus. I'll prove mine honor and mine honesty against thee presently, if thou darest stand. I dare and do defy thee. For a villain! What? Behold, oh, hurt him not, for God's sake, he is mad! Some get within him, take his sword away, bind Romeo too, and bear him to my house. Run, master, run, for God's sake! This is the priory! In, or we are spoiled! <laughs> Be quiet, people! Wherefore throng you hither? To touch my poor distracted husband, hence let us come in that we may bind him fast and bear him home for his recovery. I knew he was not in his perfect wits! I am sorry now that I did draw on him. How long hath this possession held the man? This week he hath been heavy, sour, sad, and much, much different from the man he was. But till this afternoon, his passion ne'er broke into extremity of rage. Hath he not lost much wealth by rack of sea, but buried some dear friend? Hath not us his eye strayed his affection and unlawful love, a sin prevailing much in youthful men who give their eyes the liberty of gazing? Which of these sorrows is he subject to? To none of these, except it be the last, namely some love that drew him oft from home. You should for that have reprehended him. Why, so I did. I, but not rough enough. As roughly as my modesty would let me. Hefty in private. And in assemblies, too. I, but not enough. It was the copy of our conference. In bed he slept, not for my urging it. At board he fed, not for my urging it. Alone it was the subject of my theme. In company I often glanced at it. Still did I tell him it was vile and bad. And there came it that the man was mad. The venom clamors of a jealous woman poisons more deadly than a mad dog's tooth. It seems his sleeps were hindered by thy railing, and thereof comes it that his head is light. Thou sayest his meat was sauced with thy upbraidings. Unquiet meals make for ill digestions. Thereof the raging fire of fever bred, and what's a fever but a fit of madness? Thou sayest his sports were hindered by thy brawls. Sweet recreation barred, what doth ensue but moody and dull melancholy? Kinsman to grim and comfortless despair, and at her heels a huge infectious troop of pale distemperatures and foes to life. In food, in sport, in life-preserving rest, to be disturbed with mad or man or beast. The consequence is, then, thy jealous fits had scared thy husband from the use of wits. She never reprehended him but mildly when he demeaned himself rough, rude, and wildly. Why bear you these rebukes and answer not? She did betray me to my own reproof. Good people, enter and lay hold on him. No, not a creature enters in my house. Then let your servants bring my husband forth. Neither! He took this place for sanctuary, and it shall privilege him from your hands till I have brought him to his wits again, or lose my labor in saying it. I will attend my husband, be his nurse, diet his sickness, for it is my office, and will have no attorney but myself, and therefore let me have him home with me. Be patient, for I will not let him stir till I have used the approved means I have. With wholesome syrups, drugs, and holy prayers, to make of him a formal man again. It is a branch and parcel of mine oath, a charitable duty of my order. Therefore depart. I will not hence and leave my husband here, and ill it doth beseem your holiness to separate the husband and the wife. <gasps> Be quiet and depart. You shall not have him. Come, go, I will fall prostrate at his feet and never rise until my tears and prayers have won his grace to come in person hither and take perforce my husband from the abbess. <clears throat> but this, that I will raise a fire, um, anon, I'm sure the Duke himself in person comes this way to the melancholy veil, the place of death and sorry execution behind the ditches of the abbey here. Upon what cause? To see a reverend Syracusan merchant who put unluckily into this bay against the laws and statutes of this town, beheaded publicly for his offense. See where they come, and you will behold his death. Let's kneel before the Duke before we pass the abbey. Pay the 
son for him, he shall not die. So much we tender him. Justice, most sacred duke, against the abbess. The abbess is the most virtuous and reverend lady. It cannot be that she hath done me wrong. May it please your grace. Antipholus, my husband, who I made lord of me and all I had at your important letters, this ill day a most outrageous fit of madness took him, that desperately he hurried through the street with him, his bondman, all was mad as he, doing displeasure to the citizens, by rushing in their houses, bearing thence rings, jewels, anything his rage did light. Once did I get him bound and sent him home, whilst to take order for the wrongs, I went that here and there his fury had committed. Anon, I what not, by what strong escape he broke from those that had the guard of him, and with his mad attendant and himself, each one with ironful passion, with drawn swords, met us again, and madly bent on us, chased us away, till, raising of Moray, we came again to bind them. Then they fled into this abbey, whither we pursued them, and here the abbess shuts the gates on us, and will not suffer us to fetch him out, nor set him forth that we may bear him hence. Therefore, most gracious Duke, with thy command, let him be brought forth and borne hence for help. Long since thy husband served me in my wars, and I to thee engage the prince's word, that when thou didst make a match of, the, of thy bed, to do him all the grace and good that I can. Go, some of you, knock at the abbey gate, and call the lady out as come to me. I will determine this before I stir. Oh, mistress, mistress, shift and save yourself. My master and man are both broke loose, beaten the maid's row, and bound the doctor, whose beard they have singed off with brands of fire, and even as it placed, they threw on him great pails of puddled mire to quench the hair. My, my master preaches patience to him, and the while his man with scissors nicks him like a fool, and sure, unless you send some present help between them, they will kill the conjurer. P peace, fool. Thy master and his man are here, and that is false that is report to us. Mistress, upon my life, I tell you true, I have not breathed almost since I did see it. He cries for you, and vows, if he can take you, to scorch your face and to disfigure you. Are ah! you, mistress? Fly, be gone. Come, stand by me. Fear nothing. I mean, it is my husband. Witness you that he is born of now invisible. Even now we housed him in the abbey here, and now he's there, past thought of human reason. Justice, most gracious Duke. Oh, grant me justice, even for the service that long since I did thee, when I bestrid thee in the wars, and took deep scars to save thy life. Even for the blood I shed for thee, grant me justice. Unless the fear of death doth make me doubt, I see my son in Tiflis and Romeo. Justice, sweet prince, against that woman there, she whom thou gavest me to be my wife, and has abused and dishonored me, even at the strength and height of injury. Beyond imagination is the wrong that she this day hath shameless thrown upon me. Discover how, and thou shalt find her justice. This day, great duke, she shut the doors upon me while she with harlots feasted in my house. <gasps> A grievous fault. Say, woman, didst thou so? No, my good lord, myself, he, and my sister today did dine together, so befall my soul, as this is false, he burdens me with all. Never may I look one day nor sleep one night to tell your highness that she says simple truth. O oh, perjured woman, they are both forsworn. In this, the madman justly charged them. My liege, I am advised in what I say, neither disturbed with the effect of wine nor heady wraps, provoked with raging ire, albeit my wrongs might make one wiser mad. This woman shut me at my doors by day, and that goldsmith there were he not packed with her could bear witness to it, for he was with me then. He parted to fetch a chain, and promised to bring it to the porcupine, where thou as thou and I did die. Our dinner done, and him not coming thither, I went to seek him. In the street I met him, and in his company, that gentleman there, here did this perjured goldsmith swear me down that of this day I received the chain, which, God knows, I saw not. For this he did arrest me with an officer. I did obey and sent my peasant home for certain ducats. He, with none, returned. Fairly I bespoke the officer to come with me to my house. By the way, we met my wife, her sister, and a rabble of more vile confederates. Among them one pinch, a hungry, lean-faced villain, a mere anatomy, a mountebank, a threadbare juggler, a fortune teller, a needy, hollow-eyed, sharp-looking wretch. 
a living dead man. This pernicious slave forsook, took on himself as a conjurer, and, gazing in my eyes, feeling my pulse, and with no face as for well facing me, cries out I was possessed. Then together they fell upon me, bound me, bore me thence, and in a dark and dankest vault at home, left me and my man both bound together, till, gnawing with my teeth and my bonds in sunder, I gained my freedom, and immediately ran hither to your grace, whom I beseech to give me ample satisfaction for these deep shames and great indignities. My lord, in truth, thus far I witnessed with him that he died not at home, but was locked out. But had he such a chain of thee or no? He had, my lord, and when he ran in here, these people saw the chain about his neck. Be such, I will be sworn. I heard you say you had the chain of him. After you first forswore it on the bar, and thereupon I drew my sword on you, and then you fled into this abbey here from whence I think you are come by miracle. I never came within these abbey walls, nor didst thou draw thy sword on me. I never saw the chain, so help me heaven. And this is false, you burdened me with all. This is an intricate impeach. I think you won't drink of Circe's cup. If here he were housed, then here he would have been. If you were mad, you not plead so coldly. You say he dined at home, but the goldsmith here denies that saying. Sirrah, what say you? Sir, he dined with her there at the porcupine. <laughs> he did, and from my finger snatched that ring. Tis true, my liege, this ring I had of her. Sawest thou him enter the abbey here? As sure, my liege, as I do see your grace. <laughs> Most mighty Duke, vouchsafe me speak a word. Happily I see a friend will save my life and pay the sum that may deliver me. Speak for this, Sir Cusin, what thou wilt. Is not your name, sir, called Antipolis? And is not that your bondman, Dromeo? Within this hour I was his bondman, sir. But he, I thank him, nodded to my court. <laughs> now am I Dromeo and his man unbound? I am sure you both of you remember me. Ourselves we do remember by you, for lately we were bound as you are now. <gasps> You are not pinched patient, are you, sir? Why look you strange on me? You know me well. I never saw you in my life till now. Oh, uh, grief hath changed me since you saw me last, and careful hours with time's deformed hand have written strange features in my face. Uh, but tell me yet, dost thou not know my voice? Neither. Uh, draw me know that. No, trust me, sir, no. Are I'm you sure thou dost? I, sir, but I am sure I do not, and whatsoever a man denies, you are now bound to believe him. <laughs> not know my voice. Oh, time's extremity! Hast thou so cracked and split in my poor tongue in seven short years that here my only son knows not my feeble key of untuned cares? From now this graded face of mine be hidden, drizzled winter sap consuming snow, and all the conduits of my blood frozen. Yet hath my night of life some memory, my wasting lamp some fading glimmer left, my dull deaf ears alone used to hear all these old witnesses I cannot there. Tell me thou art my son, Antipolis. I never saw my father in my life. But seven years since, and Syracuse obey, thou knowest we parted. But perhaps, my son, thou shamest to acknowledge me in misery. The Duke and all that know me in the city can say it is not so. I never saw Syracuse in my life. I tell thee, Syracuse, twenty years have I been patient to Antipolis, during which time he never saw Syracuse. See thy age and dangers make thee dote. Most mighty Duke, behold a man much wronged. <laughs> So of them, which is the natural man and which is the spirit? Who decipherest them? I, sir, am Dromeo. Command him away. 
I, Sir Andromeo. Pray let me stay. But Jean, art thou not? Or else his ghost? Oh, my old master, who hath found him here? Whoever hath found him, I will loose his bonds and gain a husband by his liberty. Speak, old Aegean, if thou beest the man that hadst a wife once called Amelia, who bore thee out of burden two fair sons, oh, speak, old Aegean. If thou beest the same man, speak, and speak unto the same Amelia. Now begins this morning's story right. These two Antipholus, these two so like, and these Dromios, one in semblance. Besides this urging of the wrecked sea, these are parents to these children, which are accidentally met together. If I dream not, but thou art Amelia, if thou art she, tell me, where is that son that floated with thee on the fatal raft? My men of Ephidamnum, he and I, and the twin Dromeo, all were taken up. But by and by, rude fishermen of Corinth by force took Dromeo and my son from me, and me they left with those of Ephidamnum. What then became of them I cannot tell. I, to this fortune, you see me in. Antipholus, thou camest from Corinth first? Uh, no, sir, not I. I came from Syracuse. Uh, stay, stand apart. I <laughs> know not which is which. I came from Corinth, my most gracious lord. And I, sir, with him. Brought by that famous warrior, Duke Metaphon, your most renowned uncle. Which of you two did dine with me today? I, gentle mistress. And are not you my husband? No, I say nay to that. And so do I, yet did she call me so. And this fair gentlewoman, her sister here, did call me brother. What I told you then, I hope I shall have pleasure to make good, if this be not a dream I see and hear. That is the chain, sir, which you had of me. I think it be, sir, I deny it not. And you, for this chain, arrested me. I think I did, sir. I deny it not. <laughs> I sent you money, sir, to be your bail, but I draw me out, but I think he brought it not. No, none by me. This purse of ducats I received from you, and Dromeo, my man, did bring them me. I see we still did meet each other's man, and I was same for him and he for me. Thereupon these errors are arose. These ducats I bought from my father here. It shall not need. Thy father hath his life. Sir, I must have that diamond from you. There, take it. And much thanks for my good cheer. Renata Duke, vouchsafe to take the pains to go with us into the abbey here, and here at large discourse of all our pains. And all who are assembled in this place, who by this sympathized one day's error have suffered wrong, go, keep us company. And we shall make full satisfaction. Thirty-three years have I begun in travail of you, my sons, until this present hour my heavy burden ne'er delivered. The Duke, my husband, and my children both, and you the calendars of their nativity, go with us to a gossip's feast. Enjoy with me, after so long grief, such nativity. And with all my heart, I will gossip at this feast. <laughs> Dromeo, what stuff of mine hast thou embarked? Your good that lay at host at the centaur. He speaks to me. I am your master, Dromeo. Come, let us go in. We'll look to that anon. Embrace thy brother there. Rejoice with him. There's a fat friend that kitchened me for you today at dinner. She now shall be my sister and not my wife. <laughs> he thinks you are my glass and not my brother. I see by you, I am a sweet-faced youth. Will you walk in to see their gossiping? Not I, sir. You are my elder. That's a question. How shall we try it? We'll draw cuts for the senior. Till then, lead thou first. Nay, then thus. We came into this world like brother and brother, and now let's go hand in hand, not one before another. Uh, uh, uh. Uh.